Hey everyone, welcome welcome back to Mid-Tier Thoughts. This is episode three. Uh, today we're going to be kind of talking uh, about ARs, kind of dive into a little bit of uh, kind of a broad topic here. I know we could probably go for hours and hours, but we're going to try to narrow it down. Talking about uh, ARs and a kind of a beginner's guide, if you will, some budget tips, some ways to talk about like quality over quantity and a few other things. So yeah, let's uh, let's dive in. Definitely awesome. I haven't talked to you since last year. <laughs> Technically, I'll you're not wrong. that one out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I'm I'm surprised that me being the dad out of the two of us didn't jump on that one first. <laughs> <laughs> I had to beat you to it, man. I was racing. <laughs> <laughs> this whole time I was just waiting for a wind to like throw it in. Um, no. Yeah, this is probably my favorite topic, dude. I 100%. love fucking guns, dude. I love it. And a little bit of context real quick for those uh, listening. Kind of the idea for the podcast is probably um, one week we will do a survival type topic, kind of how we did last week with the cold weather. The next week we're going to do a gun related thing since we kind of live, you know, live and breathe both of these aspects. I want to give equal time to this. So uh, and kind of, you know, mix up the material, keep it good. So that's kind of what to expect moving forward. But yeah, um, Mike, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you for a little bit um, here. I think we were talking about starting kind of with, you know, um, for those, sorry, let me back up. For those who don't know us, um, we we spent several years working in the firearms industry, doing sales, instruction, all kinds of sides of it. So this is kind of our bread and butter when it comes to this. So uh, kind of a sales pitch, if you will. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and let Mike start here with kind of uh, tips for ARs for beginners, man. Yeah, definitely, dude. Coming from uh, military side versus civilian side, I'd let you know that there is a lot of BS out there about firearms. Like, you need this, you need that, you need this. Realistically, this channel, I want to um, 100% focus on gear, and I want to focus on that uh, readiness mentality, that readiness um, gear to have to to make sure that you prolong your life a little bit longer if, it, you know, shit hits the fan. Um, and guess what the biggest part of your gear is going to be? It's going to be what you have to protect yourself and your family. Um, so there's going to be a lot of, um, a lot of this and that this person thinks this is better. This person thinks that is better, but when it comes down to, it comes down to training, man, get in there, know your firearm, know your equipment, know how to operate it. And, uh, this is one that not a lot of people touch on, especially the bigger creators that have the money to spend and blow you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on like MG 42s and like these awesome guns, right? Have yeah. something that other people have. And I'm not saying copycat people and just get the firearm that you see. Cause everyone else, like it looks cool. Um, but have a gun that's going to be versatile to use in the environment you're in. Exactly. I think we touched on this in one of our previous episodes, right? Like if you're the only AK guy in your group of boys, that's got all ARs, you have a logistics issue, right? You might be able to solve that personally, but no one else is carrying around AK mags for you, right? And vice versa. If you're the only AR guy in the AK crowd, right, it might behoove you uh, to, and I hate myself that I said that word, but yeah, it might, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it might be a good idea to have, to have that. So yeah, go ahead, man. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. Like if we are, might be a good idea to have an AK, have equipment that runs AK mags, you know? Um, but here in the United States, which most of our followers and listeners are probably going to be based out of, um, it's five, five, six, two, two, three, uh, AR mag styles. This is our, this is our shit, man. This is what we do. This is what mm -hmm. we use. You know, um, and, and that, and the nice thing about most five, five, six platforms is because even if it's not an AR, as much as I would like it to, to be for parts compatibility, as long as it's mag compatibility is a key thing, right? Cause like, the, what is it called? The unicorn? the the i think it's called the ak that runs 556 oh yeah 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 but uh, th most of those have proprietary magazines oh they all do they have, yeah like, they own these. yeah or even yeah. like <laughs> I, the first one that came to my mind that got a big a bunch of hype when it came out was the cz brin like that thing um, was everywhere and it was like oh you gotta have one it's the best thing ever and it was yeah. like great magazines that no one has magazines no one has parts that no one has and those guns man you bro you bust them open and, like the springs and all sorts of like weird shit going on in there mm -hmm. it's crazy um yeah have easy and simple firearms uh diving into that 
most of our viewers and listeners just know if it hits the fan and it's the end of the world, your imagination of being John Wick or being um, operator SEAL Team 7, SEAL Team 6, whatever you want to be, uh, roaming the streets uh, and clearing buildings, it's not going to happen. You're going to die really, really fast. Yeah. What, what's that that, uh, that Clint Smith says? The best way to clear a building is to get out of there and hit it with a JDAM? Yep. <laughs> what's the best way to clear a stairway? Uh, hit it with a mortar. That's that. <laughs> yes, 100%. <laughs> um, Don't. <laughs> yeah. You want to know the safest way to you know clear a building is don't go in. because <laughs> yeah. no matter what you, all the cqb you learn all the cqb <coughs> you go through what's the number one thing they teach you even in ma uh schooling or uh marine corps schooling i know we did the the course with marines and stuff like that when we we're yeah. doing cqb um the front guy if you get shot in the face uh back guy just push through them like <laughs> just keep yeah. going like, i i i remember very clearly an exercise i did with the marines one time where uh we were working with this group called RTT and they were kind of like some special dudes. Uh, I, I'm not, not like a higher tier or anything. They were just more training on CQB with, than said the most of the Marines we were with. And they're like, Hey, you guys want to come train with us? We're doing some sin round stuff. I'm like, absolutely, man. So they had all the Navy guys go up front and I was like, Oh, why is that? They're like, well, probably the first four or five of you are going to hit the deck. So we need some bodies. Yep. Oh, th- yep. th- thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first things we learned is how to step over the front guy when he gets shot in the face. Yeah. Yep. Because uh, CQB is super cool on paper, super cool on movies and in uh, videos. And it's a very essential thing to know in emergencies. But you're probably not going to live that long. Um, so with that in mind, that 10-3 build is sick, gnarly, good gnar, bro. That thing shreds, but um, probably not at 400 yards, which is the typical interaction point that i'm going to try to have with most people um i want distance i want to be away from them i want to be out in the woods i want to be on the other block away from everybody else because i want right. to live as long as i can and I, again i think part of that too also comes down to living environment right like if you live in a major city like if you live within seattle or you know la although there's probably yeah. two cities you don't have ars at but you get what i'm saying if you live in a major city a 10-3 might serve you perfectly right but yeah. if you're kind of out where you and i are where we're a mix of city, but the countryside is pretty close and you can be in the middle of nowhere in a couple minutes. That, that, that rifle that can punch out a little bit further and mm-hmm. having that standoff distance capability is crucial. And brings us to the topic of ballistics, man. Uh, hit me with a little bit. I, you know, I would kind of know some of it. You know a little bit more. Hit me with some ballistics between uh, a 10-3 versus a 16-inch, man. Because you're the big uh, Vietnam uh, era <laughs> equipment guy. <laughs> bro, me, me, and, me and that uh, 20-inch carry handle gang. Uh, <laughs> bro, yeah, I, I love how also we're talking about like running AR so you're not a weirdo. And uh, I am rocking the crap out of my PTR-91 G3 clone. Of course, in 308 of just the mp5 are. for men so uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah so little hypocrisy but i'll embrace it so uh i see your 556 and i'll raise you a 308 um <laughs> yeah so uh i mean again i'm i'm not by any means an expert i've picked up a few things working in the field of uh, firearm sales and going out and experiencing things but yeah um if you I mean the, the 5.56 cartridge was designed around a 20-inch barrel, right? The original M16, um, taking it in NOM, these things were designed around 20-inch barrels. Yep. The maximum velocity coming out of there, 20-inch barrels. You know, there's kind of a running joke and running meme in the gun community. You put some, some green tip 5.56 uh, in a 20-inch barrel, and it's like, what plates, right? <laughs> um, just go right through that, boy. And if you're running AR-500 plates, like, keep in mind, that might be what the best that you have. I would encourage you to go out and get ceramic, but that, but that's all you got. Keep in mind, if I've got 62 grain green tips out of a 20 inch barrel, that means 2,100 <laughs> feet per second, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's more than that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's nuts. So, um, you know, AR 15, so when we get down to the pistol lengths, right. I try not to go any shorter than 10, three reason for that. So when we're looking at the, the gas system, if it's not piston driven, you get shorter than 10-3, you start running into cycling issues with not enough gas being captured. Now, some companies have been able to go around that, and what they do is they kind of reinvent the muzzle brakes that they have. 
to kind of recapture some of that gas as well as some of the uh, gas block stuff that they do. So there's certain companies that do that, but again, it's not the most reliable and ballistically you're losing so much out of that cartridge that it's yeah. not really that worth it. Yeah. Is this super small and compact? Totally. But you lose so much out of it. Now, if it's 300 blackout and you're running, you know, you can run that thing as short as you want. You know, you want a five inch little shorty boy, knock yourself out. It'll work. Right. Like a rattler or something like that for like an MCX. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, even though, even though the 300 blackout design was based around the honey badger with a seven inch barrel to get optimal powder burn yes. out of that round. Yes. So, I mean, it's funny that you brought up the uh, 400 yard in- engagement distance. Cause I remember back when I first started getting into kind of like the prepper mentality, people would be like, Oh, should I go AR or AK? You know, and people are like, Oh, well, AKs only have a, you know, an optimal range of 300 yards and an AR is 500. And it's like, bro, who, how far are you shooting people? Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like if either way you're at 300 yards and you're not bothering me and a grid has gone down scenario, I'm probably not worrying about you. Yeah. Go, you know let's I mean? waste all of the ammo right at the beginning of the fight. Exactly. Let me not just, even hitting anybody because no one trains right. at 400 yards. No exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, when it comes to ballistics, um, if you want the best bang for your buck, right, is the 20 inch barrel. Now, most of us understand that's a modern day musket, right? So <laughs> the dead, the dead. Inch. Yeah. Average, average is running around 16 inches, right? I would, um, even, I would even debate you on that one. That 16 inches become almost a dead inch one as well. Yeah, you got a little more of the rise of the 14.5s and the 13.7s, which mm-hmm. for those who are newer to this, right, I might be questioning like, like ATF, blah, 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 whatever, right? So as long as it, if you have a 13.7 or a 14.5, as long as you have a pinned and welded muzzle device, that can yeah. extend your barrel to 16 inches unless you're running it as a pistol or as an SBR, which all well means like screw the NFA in the first place. But right. Become you know, if you're trying not to catch felonies, right, for legal purposes, whatever, um, you know, you don't want to ruby ridge yourself. That's the way to do it. <laughs> so like you, you and I know a guy, you know, yeah, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Right. T-Rex light. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a buddy of ours who looks very close to T-Rex arms. Um, you know, we're, we're in the shop one day. And he's like, oh, should I be running a 13.7? He's like, oh, he's like, no, I've, I've got my 10.3. I've got my 14.5. I think I'm going to build a 13.7. And we, you and I both looked at each other and we're like, but why, though? You know, yeah. <laughs> ballistically, you're almost identical out of the two. Oh, dude. And, you yeah. know, I'm just sitting here debating the whole 14.5 to 10.3. So the 10.3, the thing about the 10.3, what I don't like, and people can fight me in the comments about this one. Go ahead and do it, dude. It's everywhere. It is what it is. You're going to beat that gun to death. It's going oh, to beat itself dude. to death. Yeah. I tell you, okay, so my first AR that I, that I, my first AR build, when I first got off active duty, I put together a uh, Paul metal lower with, I don't even remember who the upper was from, but they Bear weren't Creek like, a, <laughs> no, it, no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. I wasn't that bad. It was, it was, it was called hardened arms. I had no idea who they are. I'm pretty sure they're out of business. I'm pretty sure it was like a knockoff B- BCA. I don't know. I have beat the crap out of that thing. And uh, I have had, I have replaced so many different pieces on that gun over time. And when I ran it suppressed, I had to run one of the bootleg bolts that's adjustable yeah. um, to in there because otherwise I was basically like just gassing myself in just, the face it's, it's every the single over time. And over. The notebook dude, over and over, dude, oh, crying, just crying, just tears. tears. <laughs> you know, my, my, my optic was just occluded by my depression. Um, <laughs> it was, it was miserable, you know. And um, I had to go through a lot of changes on that. Eventually, you know, doing a bunch of that, and that kind of leads into some of the other things we talk about. You know, like quality versus quantity of the whole, like buy once, cry once versus a budget type thing, right? And yeah. it's one of those things where it's like no matter what you do, know that you're going to get what you're going to pay for and go into it with that mentality. Right. hundred percent. But, well, but here's where I say it's beating itself to death. The, a big thing with me is I have a 14, five Daniel defense, uh, you know, not flexing on you pores or anything, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I Sad. love it. <laughs> I love it because it's uh, longevity of the bolt. It's not going to beat itself into the ground right. like the 10, three. Uh, and it's going to be a little bit longer. If you honestly, 
uh, most people, like all the uh, freaking people, are fighting all over my uh, social media because they're like, "Ooh, fourteen five versus ten three. The ballistics are almost identical. If you look at the velocity, the turn to the bullets, they're pretty close together. Not getting much out of that fourteen five versus a ten three. And it's not about the round hitting is what I'm worried about, the velocity and everything like that. But it's more of um, the power to burn out of it and the longevity of the bolt. The, yeah. the 10 3s, how many bolts have you had to replace at the shop? Because people buy the 10 3s thinking they're cool as hell. And next thing you know, a couple thousand rounds later, bolts shot. It's done. It's done for. Yeah. You know, and that, that's the thing, too, is is there is such a thing as being overgassed. You know, and especially when it comes to builds and people running variations of different gas lengths and just, you know, beating the crap out of the rifles um, or just, going hog wild on over tightening things and doing stupid stuff. I've seen a lot of bad, stupid mistakes from people who thought they could build their rifle. Now you can build a rifle and I would say it is fairly easy upper, lower, the whole thing. You can do it 20 minutes in a YouTube video. You just have to pay attention and know what you're doing. Right. I've seen gas tubes put in up. I've seen all kinds of stupid stuff. You know, I don't know why it doesn't work. I don't know why I'm beating the crap out of my gun. I don't know why everything's broken. Oh, it's because you put it together with retardation. <laughs> and also, like I, like we were saying, well, like we're harping on, that barrel length, that gas pushing back, everything, especially if you shoot pre- suppress, which <laughs> in 2022, I'm going to be pushing this all 2022. Go buy a suppressor. Stop 100%. Being, stop being dumb. Just go buy if you are waiting, <laughs> If you are one of those people who is going to sit there and be like, I'm waiting for the Hearing Protection Act to go through. Bruh, we had a Republican president house and senate and didn't get a single pro-gun law passed don't wait on the government to solve your problems go buy a suppressor and if you're one of those people who's like i don't want them to know what i have that they're going to put me on a list for the nfa they, they, they already know they already know oh are you are you on are you on instagram have you posted pictures of your guns that we already know they already know yep. it, it's a thing just assume they know and screw them and buy the suppressor Dude, they only <laughs> debatably <laughs> only gun that they do not know you have is your great 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 grandpa's uh 22 that's been passed down since the farm since like 72 you know exactly exactly <laughs> right so 100 percent um but yeah so I, and i think part of that too going into that with um kind of the different things with that too is, is if you're going to go with like a 10-3 right or you're going to go with 16, 14, 5, whatever barrel length to go into kind of comes into this one thing where it's going to come into mindset. It's going to be your choice, right? But there's two way main things that I generally see. I generally see people building specialized builds or GPRs. So specialized builds would be like a pistol specifically set up for like in the truck as a truck gun or like CQB type type of purpose, right? Um you know, or you've got your 16 inch rifle set up in a certain way with maybe an LPVO and a red dot because this serves a specific role. And then you've got an 18 inch build and it's got, you know, a two and a half to 10 and a bipod. And this is your designated marksman rifle type of deal. Or you're the kind of guy who does a GPR. And by that, I mean general purpose rifle. And they t- kind of talked about this a lot on like the Barrel and Hatchet podcast. Big fans mm-hmm. of those guys. Oh, yeah. Where, They're- you know, You've got like a 14 and a half or 16 inch gun with like a Trigicon, uh, ACOG and like a red dot on top. And it can kind of do a little bit of everything. It can reach out and touch somebody. You can kind of choke up on the stock, do CQB. And for anyone who's like, oh, 16 inch rifle, CQB, homeboy, we were clearing Fallujah with 20 inch ARs. All right. Yeah. Relax. <laughs> <And in> the- <laughs> with a little bit of dedication. <laughs> 100%. The Marines were high stock, like, you know, up over the shoulder and M16s with bayonets. Like, I I don't hear your complaint. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, have that in mind on, like, what you're going to do with it, right? Like, one of my things I would love to do, and I know I've talked to you about this, I believe, is uh, there's a company out there called Klein Machining, and they make a 24-inch heavy barrel AR upper with a bipod that is designed to be an LR, I mean, sorry, an AR RPK. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just maybe <laughs> like a heavy RPK style AR, right? Throw an echo trigger in there and just lay hate. That is a very specialized <laughs> rifle, right? That is not something that's like, oh man, when the world ends, I have to grab one rifle to go out the door. No. That's like, 
hey, I'm going to go on the back of a white Toyota in the desert and do stuff, right? Like, <laughs> do some cool so, stuff. Exactly. So, like, in my opinion, if you're going to do your first rifle, um, no matter which way you go about that, if it's your first AR, I kind of recommend going the general purpose route because, like, starting with either a 14 and a half or 16 inch barrel, get something semi quality, right? Um, and get like a really solid setup there and then have fun with it. If you want to go out, because now you have every basis covered, then if you're like, man, I want something shorter for the truck gun, perfect, go do it. Or yeah. man, I want to, I want to SPR. Go to it, you know. Yeah. But you have something that kind of covers all of those bases. That's just my take on it, you know. Is, is I, I like to have the box checked before I start going anywhere else. Yep. So with your fourteen five, I, I'm a big fourteen five pusher. You can LPVO, you can EOTech, doesn't matter because you can still reach out and touch things at that four hundred, three hundred yards. You can still clear houses with it. You can still do a lot of things with it. And then when you throw a suppressor on the front of it, 2022, buy your suppressor, um, throw a suppressor on the front of it, uh, you still are at a decent length that you're not just running around with a lance, dude, like a full spear, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Even like, even when I look Especially at the, depending on the suppressor you're running, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the size of that and the length, you know, if you're running one of those um, Surefire, the Surefire cans, uh, yep. One of the Gen ones. I mean, like you're you're in the foot on the rifle, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Exactly, dude. I'm being a little hyperbolic, but for real, like you know, I'm being a little exaggerating. But it's it's a big old boy, you know, versus running like a smaller YHM can, you know, where you're still adding like you know a couple inches. But yeah, it, it just depends on yeah. that too, and and that's that's something to consider. You get that 16 inch rifle, and you put a six inch can on it. Now you have a 22 inch rifle. Exactly. You get that 16 inch and then you add, you know, eight inches to six inches, whatever it may be to the front of it. You're, you're long. So that 10, three might not be a horrible idea if you're, you know, doing a lot of um, close quarters combat and you can still get your six inch can on there and you're not outrageously long. And since we're talking about beating the gun, the rifle to death, one thing to consider too, if you do want to run a suppressor, um, on on a smaller right on a smaller platform like that keep in mind there are aftermarket things you can do to kind of optimize your rifle for that there's um i think geisley makes a charging handle that's specifically designed for running suppressed kind of um help with some of the over gassing there's uh, a silent that's who does it that's who does it yeah um different buffers you can get adjustable bolt carriers to limit some of the gas um adjustable gas blocks and then um what else is there? Oh, and then the suppressor itself. If you can find a flow through can, meaning a can that's kind of got like exit vents on the front to where for those who don't know the way a suppressor normally works is, you know, all that gas is captured in the tube, right? And doesn't escape. It comes back and goes out your whenever your bolt opens, right? So if you can get a flow through can, all that excess gas that's not captured eventually does go out the front. So it does you know, help with the gassing issue and you're not going to beat that rifle to death anymore as much yeah. as you would previously. Yeah. Sig makes a phenomenal one, dude. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, well, that's the thing is, is, and let's kind of harp on the suppressor thing again. We are now keep it. I want, before someone says some stupid stuff about it, we are not sponsored by anybody. All right. Yeah. So I am not telling you to go buy a suppressor because someone is giving you money. I am telling you to do it because it's something you should be doing. Right, because when uh, it comes down to being uh, prepared, which is this whole you know thing is about, uh, being ready, being prepared, that's going to be one of the most essential tools you need. Also, just the benefit of being able to not have to wear ear pro while shooting is pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent, um, man. But yeah, so kind of going with that, going back to kind of like budget versus buy once, cry once, right? Is yeah. Let, once you've decided what platform you want to go with, what what size barrel length you want to go with, an air pistol, rifle, whatever. Now you've decided, all right, cool. I know what rifle I want. I got to start building it or buying it. My advice to you is this. If you are on a budget and you can only afford the budget rifle, that is okay. But know that honestly what you are getting. Do not go into it thinking you're buying your Smith & Wesson M&P 15 or your PSA cheapo build and going to get the same kind of performance you will out of a super high-end rifle. 
right? Yep. And you don't don't worry about the whole Bubba sitting there be like, I ran a thousand rounds through it, didn't have no problem. Well, that's fine, right? He might have, you might not. A large company like PSA pumping out a ton of product, a lot of it works, a lot of it works really well. But when it's messed up, it's messed up bad. Their QC is not that great. I've I've seen that firsthand. I can't tell you 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 have too. You know, I mean, like I can't tell you how how many PSAs I've had to fix. You know, now, now the customer service is awesome, and they'll fix it, right? But how many times I've seen catastrophic failures in QC, where like I've seen gas tubes installed wrong. You know, yeah, and, like yeah. how do you, like it's only on one end. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And everyone's always like, oh, the customer service is really good. So no matter what, if I buy this crappy rifle, you know, I can get it fixed. But we aren't preparing for going out to the We're preparing for, you know, crappy times. Right. And my, my, my thing is, as a consumer, nothing pisses me off more than buying a product to immediately have to send it back to the manufacturer. Oh, I'm immediately that, turned off. I'm regardless turned off. of what it is, no matter what the product is, right? If I have to send it back as soon as I got now, I mean, if it's four years of hard use and you got a warranty, that's one thing. But if it's like I've opened it up, I've used it one time and immediately broke, I hate that company, no matter who they are. <laughs> um, and I can tell you, it's put a sour taste in my mouth with with several companies out there. One of them I'll name that we're not going to get sponsored by after this point, Springfield. Springfield Armory. Oh. oh man! When when I worked at the gun shop, we had kind of a spiff program, right? Sell enough guns for certain companies, you get reward points, yada yada. I got a free Springfield Saint Edge, right? Took it to the rifle, super. I mean, took to the rifle to the range, super stoked. I'm ready to just lay some hate, right? This thing's super lightweight, kind of rifle. The firing pin was out of spec, out of the box. I was getting light strikes out of the box and I'm like, what, what is this? And at the first I thought it was the spring is that we couldn't figure it out. And finally we, we swapped out the firing pin with one of my other ARs. No problem. It was an out of spec and looking at it, it was just ever so short. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Right. <laughs> like, How do you miss something like that? You know? Yeah. And, and I wound up just buying a new firing pin to throw it in there because they were going to, it was going to take forever for them to send to, to get it and send it back. So I was like, you know what? Don't even bother. I'll fix it myself. But um, it was one of those things where it was like, cool. Well, that tells me about your quality control. And maybe this was an isolated incident, but from working at the gun shop, I know it's not. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but I, I encourage people to buy once, cry once, right? Because if you're going into it with, I'm going to spend $700 on a cheapo rifle and I'll upgrade parts over time. You are setting yourself up for failure. You're never going to actually do that. Me saying it from experience. And if you do, you're going to wind up spending more money on the replacement parts to turn it into the $1,500 rifle than just saving a little bit of money and buying a $1,500 rifle. I, yeah, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that are like, oh, I just... You know, I just I'm gonna get something cheap and then just have you know over time upgrade it and stuff like that. And I understand if you can't afford it, I get it, man. I've been there too, struggle busting it. But if you have a little bit of savings, you have a little bit of money, and you're like, all right, I'm ready to buy a gun. Um, how about instead of buying that super cheap AR, you get into a moderate AR, a a midfield playing ground AR, one that you know is gonna operate good, and you go from there. You start from there. Yeah. You know, I think the big thing is people have this idea in their head is like, well, for $1,200, I can get the Palmetto kit. I can get a bunch of mags. I can get uh, a red dot and like a cheap flashlight. And then I'm set to a certain extent. Yes. Depending on what you're going to use it for, that might wind up working for you. I would, I'm not saying that Palmetto is bad, right? I'm nothing against them, right? I have plenty of their stuff. I'm just saying, don't be the guy on the forum or whatever that's like, well, my Palmetto is just as good as your Knight's Armament AR. It's not. Okay? It's not. Just understand that. That's like trying to tell somebody, you know, that your crappy little Ford Metro, like your Geo Metro or whatever, right? Your Ford Pinto is as good mm-hmm. as somebody's luxury vehicle. It's not. We all know no. this. I mean, it's not going to happen. If- now. 
and, and you, you go ahead. You, to even to like advanced motions of it, like even if it runs and shoots, right? You're never mm-hmm. gonna get the recoil impulse, the the smoothness, the gas right out of a PSA than you would out of a Knight's nice armament. Right. A- exactly. So there, there's they they make quality stuff. I will say their quality control has gotten better over the years. Um, I think part of that is because they've grown so much and they've had so much negative press. They've kind of forced themselves to address that. But keep in mind, you know, you get what you pay for, right? So it's a great way to start. And if you are going to actually change out things on those rifles to make them better, that's I would encourage you instead of doing it piecemeal, just go out and buy a quality upper. Because as we've said, a lower is a lower is a lower, right? Yep. Yep. Just go out and buy and replace that co- that with a quality upper. That's my buy biggest that thing. Upper. Yeah, buy that Daniel upper or or whatever company. Uh, a DC yeah, company BCM, upper. something like BCM, that. BCM, yeah. PWS. Um, but yeah. They all make great uppers. Exactly. You know, and that was always our thing is, you know, part of it's a little bit of sales. Part of it is also like being honest with people. When people would come into the shop, right, wanting to get their first AR, we would always try to encourage them if they could to go mid tier, right? <laughs> Little yeah. shameless plug, mid tier thoughts. Um, <laughs> but yeah, go kind of mid tier, right? Now, what do we mean by mid tier? And my idea, mid tier is like that one thousand to fifteen hundred dollar range. I understand for a lot of people that's a stretch. For me, so like for me, I have a Daniel Defense DDM4. I couldn't afford that at the time that I bought it. I wound up selling two lower tier ARs, my Saint Edge, which I guess you could argue was mid tier at the time, had it worked. Um, <laughs> but once it was working, I didn't sell a bad gun. I don't want any people to think I'm a dirt bag, but no, uh, sold the same edge and my MP 15, I got the money from that, bought a Daniel, right? Daniel's on the higher, like what I would call the lower, the higher end of lo- mid tier and the lower end of high tier. Um, yeah, you know, and so if, if the military say, uses it, it's probably mid tier. <laughs> right right so i would say you know try to go for like the fn 15 um stag arms even though they're cheaper than mid-tier i would qualify as mid-tier i've seen some really good stuff come out of them especially their classic series i've seen some but, decent uppers from them dude yeah but you know the big thing too is like people get wrapped up to where they have to leave the gun store with all the bells and whistles 10 mags and a thousand rounds that day for under a thousand bucks if you do that yeah. you're leaving with with a bunch of good stuff and a crappy rifle right Think of this as an investment. Go buy your budget that you had for your whole setup. Buy the thousand dollar rifle. Thank me later. Yeah. Then yeah. when you have time, because you know what, all you need for that to get it running is a pair of iron sights. Yeah. Right. So now you've got iron sights. Fantastic. Your next upgrade should be a sling and a light, because you need a way. Well, you need some type of sights, which most rifles these days aren't coming with. Right. So you need a way to look at you to get on target. You need a way to see in the dark. You need a way to keep the rifle on you. Everything else after that is user preference. That's it. Yeah, hundred you know? percent, dude. That's all you need to be to do to have to be effective. Um, the Marine Corps teaches people to shoot iron sights up to five hundred yards. Am I asking you to do that? No. Can you hit at one? Can you can you hit steel at hundred with irons? That should probably be ideal. Um, that that's all I'm asking out of people, right? Yeah. And, even, yeah. and even then, you know, it, it, so it's like, cool, then, then upgrade, you know, then go get that red dot, then go get that, you know, extra stuff. A pair of, um, what are they? What, what's the company? Uh, Magpul iron sights. Not expensive, dude. If you're yeah. buying that mutual rival, buy out. I can't tell you how many guns I sold. Where I'm like, hey, just to let you know, this AR doesn't come with any sights. Uh, and they're like, oh, it's no biggie. Da, da, da. And then I'd see him at the range. Uh, no sights at all whatsoever on their gun, and uh, and they're trying to shoot it. And I'm like, what are you doing, bro? I'm winging it, bro. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just hell marrying it. Um, yeah, you know, and that goes that goes kind of to my next topic. And I know you and I could go on for days about this. Right. Let's assume you've bought, you followed my advice. You bought a mid to mid tier or upper tier rifle. You've got a quality, solid, let's call it service rifle for you. Now you're looking at optics. Do not make the mistake. I am trying to save you from the path that we have all gone down ourselves. Yeah, I've been there. Of buying red anodized bull crap to put on your parts because you thought it looked like the Punisher and forty dollar knockoff uh, AR optics, right? I, I, I'll you, save them a ton of time right now, dude. If it's on Amazon, don't buy it. A hundred percent. The exception to that would be if it is another company's thing that you are going to buy 
for example, like primary arms, and they happen to have a legitimate primary arms on Amazon, which I've seen, that's fine. Yep, I've, I was but it, if it says Trigicon and there's two G's in it and there's a J that's supposed to spell it, right? That's a yeah. Chinese knockoff. When the Trigicon is $100 instead of 1500 you didn't score a great deal. You got ripped off. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone buy an M1A, right? And it, so like the civilian version of the M14, $1,700 rifle all day long or more. And they put a Chinese knockoff ACOG on it for 100 bucks that has the glass the glass clarity of Helen Keller's eyesight. <laughs> the optic can turn three different colors because that's doesn't you know because that matters for some reason. And you can literally see the specs in the in the glass. It's just the, it it doesn't mount. It you can't hold zero. It's a piece of garbage. It's not even good as a hammer, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um and and you've you've bought a seventeen hundred dollar rifle, and you have limited yourself by a thirty dollar piece of equipment as to how effective you can be. If you can't, you can't <laughs> fight. If you can't aim, you can't fight. Like yeah, it's just what it, it's just like being a really really good track runner and then running in flip flops. What are you doing, bro? It, exactly, exactly. You know, um, I saw I just saw a meme the other day. I can't remember who was. What, what it was about but it, it was some kind of sales thing and someone was making fun of it and this person is shooting a scar with a sight mark uh you know on it and it's basically the sight marks version of the knockoff eotech yep and sight mark is basically the company that sells like they, they sell the slightly like a name brand version of amazon knockoffs <laughs> And, uh, yeah, you know, it's like, great. You have a $3,500 rifle and you put a $68 optic on it. There's a saying that you should expect to spend almost as much on your optics as you do on your rifle. Yep. Uh, especially if you're in the hunting or if you're into uh, marksman shooting or anything like that, they say, whatever you spend on your rifle, double it for your optic. Right. Now we've gotten lucky in the sense that like the technology for red dots and stuff has gotten really good and that a lot of things have come down in price. Right. Um, if you want to go out and like, like hollow sun, for example, yes, I know they're Chinese. However, they are making some pretty solid stuff and you can get into it for fairly inexpensive. And that's like the one time where I would say that maybe going the Chinese route might save you a little, a couple bucks because most of the stuff at like SIG and vortex it's all made in the same Chinese factory as Hollow Sun. It's yeah, just that's where, different. That's where I got beef, dude. People are literally out here spending all this money on SIG and things like that when it's literally manufactured in the same place Hollow Suns are. Yeah, it's made in USA, which apparently is a province in China. Um <laughs> <laughs> It's it's just all the parts and pieces that are made with those hollow suns are just manufactured in the United States and three hundred dollars more. Yeah, exactly, exactly, right. So, so do a little bit of research, know what you're getting into. If it seems like too good of a deal, it is, right? Yeah. And uh, I can tell you, having gone through that process myself, to kind of learn the difference between things, seeing things in action, you get what you pay for. Plain and simple. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I totally understand when you're on a budget, you're trying to bow on a budget. Absolutely. If you can only afford the $100, like $100 SIG MSR red dot, that's fine. Right. Just understand that, that, that that's fine. You know, understand where you're at, understand your capabilities, train to be the best you can with what you have. Yeah. Um, and I'm not crapping on anyone running a poor man setup. I have plenty of poor man setup. I am a poor man myself. I just got I lucky. In, <laughs> yeah, I am in fact, in fact, poor. I just got lucky enough in my prior occupation to have the ability to get access to some good stuff at good prices, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean that that's kind of the thing, right? Is is know what you're getting into, know the difference, and don't be the guy who's who's don't be the just as good guy, right? Like it's not for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there some stuff out there that's just overhyped? Absolutely. H and K, I'm looking at you. Uh, but they don't <laughs> Hey, you don't you don't talk dirty about my SP5s, all right, man. 
Like that. Hey, <laughs> I'm just saying between Zenith, Century, and PTR, and everybody else that's coming out and making MP5s now, right? There's mm-hmm. no reason for God's Green Earth to pay almost four grand for an H and K MP5 outside of yeah. outside of Flex, right? Yeah, flex on the pores, man. It's outdated equipment, but it's so cool. Right. When Zenith can make the same thing for like nine hundred bucks and it works, it's like, okay, you know, go screw yourself, H and K, right? But they don't care because they're they're not for the pores anyway. Anything um, that I spend seventy dollars on mags, looking at used to cut hundred and ten dollars a mag, um, still cool. Yeah. Now, actually, speaking of magazines, I want to bring this up because so you and I have both said that we live in Washington. For those who are listening to this and are not from Washington, it's about uh, was it two years ago? Yeah, I think two years ago, Washington. So Washington gun laws have gotten really gay over the last five years, right? They used to be pretty sweet. They've gotten really bad over the last couple of years. Um, so you have to be 21 to purchase a semi-automatic rifle in Washington. You have a wait period for it. They're considered an assault weapon now because the state's retarded. And recently they passed a 10 round magazine ban, similar to California. Now the difference though, was you could keep what you already had, right? So people went out and bought tons of mags, right? So my advice to you, no matter where you live, Go out and buy as many magazines as humanly possible. I would say, and I'm not being hyperbolic when I say this, legitimately buy 100 magazines. It doesn't have to be all at one time. Buy 100 magazines for every platform that you have. Mm -hmm. Buy at least 10 for the platforms you want to have or do not have but others have. The reason I say that is when the day comes, if it comes in a state where you're at and they say, Hey, we're talking about magazine bands. Guess what? You're set. You got a hundred, you got a hundred magazines. Well, right? I mean, you're, you're set in an essential, you're set in a way people don't like to admit it, but magazines are where items, man. Absolutely. You go through mags, mags break spring stretch. Like it is what it is. You go through mag. You're not going to buy a mag and that's the mag you have for the rest of the gun's life. It's, it doesn't work like that. Magazines are where items, man. Now, now, with that said, some magazines hold up better than others. I mean, I've got some G3 mags from the 60s that are solid, right? Um, but again, they are use items. They have springs in them. You can probably still buy spring kits and parts and replace them. But the reason I say 100 magazines is that realistically, you're probably going to use like 10 to 12 at the range because that's three to 400 rounds. Most of us, some of us are dumping more than that at the range. A lot of us, you know, are balling on a budget. We can't necessarily afford to go out and dump 500 rounds every time we go shoot. I would love to, right? That would be ideal, but sometimes I can't always afford that, right? So you're probably dumping 10 to 12 rounds out of those mags each time you use them. You have 100 magazines, which means you have 10 replacements for that original set, right? Or perhaps you like to keep certain magazines in your gear and in other places. Like I have you know, magazines still in the packaging that are there for me to use later, right? specifically for the purpose of when wear and tear happens or if I break something or I lose something. Um, I have magazines for guns I don't own yet because the idea was, well, if I get the mags now and they go to ban those, as long as the guns are still legal, I can go buy the gun. Now I got mags and I don't have to go buy a cucked 10 round mag because I already got mags for it. (laughs) You know, like I don't have an AK currently. Right. Um, But I have AK mags. So when I go out and I buy an AK, I got mags for it. Yeah, 100%. you know, you had an AK at one point, but yeah, at one point, but that, um, uh, yeah, that's yeah. a different story, yeah, no. but yeah, <laughs> I- I'll tell you that one later. That's, yeah. a, that's an <laughs> offline story. Um, I admit nothing. Uh, <laughs> well, um, like I was saying, man, uh, what it comes down to is you can sit here and listen to us all day about what kind of AR to buy and everything like that, but get out and train, go, go pick up your AR, absolutely the closet or wherever it's at and and you go train go shoot man uh this is a bicycle think of it that way you can be you can hop on a bicycle right now i'm 26 i can hop on a bike right now and i'll be able to ride it right not good because i haven't been on one since i was like 14 you know so guns are the same you can know how to shoot but when you pick it up you're going to be rusty this is a it's a skill that you need to practice absolutely Absolutely. It's a skill you need to practice, which means, um, you know, obviously that live fire portion, but also don't be afraid to dry fire. 
you know? Yeah. Don't be afraid to yeah. dry fire your rifle. Yeah, you got to rack the bolt every right time. Now, yeah, if you're going through hard times right now and you cannot afford the ammunition, there's nothing stopping you from sitting there on your couch, even in the dark, if you can't afford electricity. And yeah. <laughs> dry fire, man. Um, you know, actually, that brings up another good thing. A little little cool tool I have. Um, CMMG makes a 22 caliber conversion bolt for your AR. So I've used it before in my Daniel and in my AR pistol. It's literally you just take your bolt out, drop in this new one with a different charging handle, and you can run 22 caliber, like 22 LR um, in your AR. And it comes with magazines. And they make 10 round and 25 round variants, depending on where you live. So if you want to get those reps in and you don't want to dump a ton of money, um, like where we're at, right, there's there's a gun range near us that does like an indoor fun shoot, kind of a, sh- a run and gun type course. Um, and I used to go do that with the 22 caliber conversion kit because they're a pistol caliber range, right? They don't do rifles there. And so I would go throw in that 22 caliber conversion kit and I could go, you know, do it's it's like usually like 30 shots a run. You know, so I'd go through and okay, great. I shot a hundred rounds between three different courses of fire. I wasted, you know, four dollars <laughs> as yeah. opposed to forty, you know, or whatever, right? For different platforms because I'm running twenty two. And um, at least in my rifle, I ne- I didn't notice any negative effects from it. I didn't have any issues, and it was all the reps are the same. It's just it's twenty two. And if you have a 22 caliber version of your rifle, like if you have one of those MMP 1522s or something like that, like go use that, man. Get your reps in and and don't do I ball on a budget, dog. Like shoot 22. That's totally cool. Yeah, Ain't no I mean you can't practice the recoil, but it's right. It's, yeah, you're practicing the basics. Yeah, you're getting a lot of reps in, and uh, I, I think back to like that. Um, you remember that T Rex Arms video where they had the Japanese kid who only ever did airsoft. Yeah, and came yeah. out. Yeah, came out and shot with Lucas, and it was like he had to learn a little bit of recoil impulse, and then he was boom right there, and he was just mirroring, mirroring Lucas, and it was like he went out and did the dry fire. He was doing everything with a different platform, and getting those skills and those reps and the movements in, because that's mainly what it is. Yeah, it's a hundred percent. It's just about how you move, how you can handle it, how you. How you do stuff like that. So if you know dry fire, you can do things like that. You will be uh, significantly better than most people. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one more thing too to kind of touch on before we wrap up. So retro versus modern. (laughs) Um, Retro is dope. Don't get me wrong. But I feel like retro is one of those things that's more of really cool to have because you have a surplus or an excess of a lot of things and modern is the way to be if you're not if your current setup is not modern um you're going to be behind the curve on a lot of things you're going to be mm-hmm. behind the curve on a lot of stuff i i th- I, I agree 100 percent. i think the the retro trend is really cool to see as a mill surf guy and kind of a history guy it's kind of cool to see people getting into like gordon carbines you know carry handles with old school aim points, things like that. Right. Um, and kind of also seeing kind of the blend of stuff where people are doing that, that retro build, but they're putting modern optics and modern stuff on it. Dude, the mini Lucas, I mean, uh, Lucas light that we work with, how he yeah. made fun of Gary handle. He made fun. Yeah. Of yeah. Like that. Until I had brought that Colt in. <laughs> he was like, wow, that rifle looks dumb. Ha ha ha. And then, you know, all of a sudden when retro became trendy, who built one? So for so to kind of give some context to that, um, I had a killer deal on a Colt SP1. If you don't know what that is, look it up. An old school Colt AR carbine, right? Like pre ban uh, killer deal on one. Bought the Brownells four power retro carry handle scope, threw it on there, and a Car 15 stock. Um, looked super dope, right? Brought it in. I was like making nom jokes and everything, right? He's like, oh, man, bro, that's so dumb. Carry handles, bro, dumb. And I'm like, bro, homie, you just bought like that 1.93 riser. It's the same thing, you know? And then, yeah, then he goes home like two weeks later, watches Black Hawk down, comes back, buys everything clone correct for a Gordon carbine. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, homie, what? But, but yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, 
obviously the modern stuff is the modern rail systems, um, upgraded triggers. You know, I'm, better... I'll, I'm I, I I'll dive into it in another episode, but quad rail is not old. Quad rail yeah. is still in its day. It works, you know. And the the funny thing about it too is like whether it be M lock or quad rail, right? If it's quad, most of the M lock stuff nowadays. Most of the M-Lock stuff, you can just direct mount into M-Lock, um, which is nice, but you still got to have the wrenches and everything for that. But just some, oh, half your stuff out there, you're going to wind up getting an M-Lock, an M-Lock Picatinny rail anyway. Mm-hmm. Plus, I can't grade cheese on my M-Lock. So. That's what I'm saying, dude. I can <laughs> dig in. Right? Well, like I said, that'll be an episode for a later time. Uh, so I, like, like I said before, man, the, the retro is super dope in surplus. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think it's one of those things to where um, if you have the ability to go modern, go modern. Once you have that box checked off, right, then go back and get the retro. Caveat to that, if all you can afford is that budget AR build, right? And by retro, I mean like you went to Cla- you went to Palmetto and they had the old school A2 carry handle style upper and the plain Jane M4 style lower. If that's all you can afford, optimize it the best you can right yep. you can you can modernize any retro gun absolutely as long as that carry handle is not permanently fixed you know and it's removable whatever right or it's sometimes just a flat top you make the best with what you got right and trick it out make it work make it work for you add the accessories you need like we said once you get the rifle first things to source after that obviously iron sights of some sort or you know red dot whichever way you're going to go with that you need some type of sighting system prison i won't die too deep because that's all <laughs> right we, we can get into that another one yeah um some type of optic system to be able to get on target whether it be some people will run just optics no iron sights some people run iron sights no optics i like having uh backup irons just because i've seen enough stuff break batteries die it gets cold enough here like i know people that have this argument that like red dots or whatever, like the technology's arrived where you can just beat the crap out of them. You never need irons, whatever. I don't care. I still want, I still want irons because I'm a, re- I'm a redundant person and I just want to make sure it's going to work. <coughs> still die, man. Batteries yep. still die. Absolutely. Or my retarded self goes, did I change the batteries this year or last year? Oh, it'll be fine. And then I take it out <laughs> and shoot it and it's dead. Um, the other thing then is obviously a sling. Keep it on you, right? And yep. a light. And I feel like I have to say this because someone's going to address it. I understand that Kyle Rittenhouse has killed more commies than I have with a $500 <laughs> rifle and a sight mark, right? I understand that. But I think if he had his choice between that and a, and a day and, you know, a higher end like Daniel Defense or BCM, something like that, the other choices might have been made in his rifle selection. <laughs> you know, and, and another thing is the situational based things. The things we're talking about, the readiness we're talking about is not going to a protest. It's it's end of the country kind of deal. Yeah. We're, we're talking about, you know, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, if things continue down the path that they're going and we all kind of see the writing on the wall and it goes back to the Wild West which may not be the case everywhere, but probably going to wind up being the case in some places. If you're responsible for your own security, I want to have the best tools available within my budget restrictions. Exactly. Exactly, man. And uh, uh, as always, man, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I thank you so much for uh, just talking with me. And yeah. uh, let's, let's do this more. If you guys have any criticism you want to put out there, if you have anything that you want to add and uh, something you want to hear more in the chat uh just let us know yeah i feel like this one's definitely going to get some uh some spicy comments <laughs> oh dude i hope it does uh and if you want to fight oh, and, me i'll post and, my address <laughs> every ak ak guy listening to this right now is like well i don't want to i don't want to play with you anymore <laughs> 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 all right man well hey uh like i said uh, like like you like you said, um, it's always a pleasure, man. Uh, for those that want to reach out to us, um, again, it's at not the ATF AJ and at Mike Travis dot thirty one. Either way, on Instagram, you can reach out to us. I think if you're listening to this on Spotify, there should be a way for you to answer que- to ask us questions on there. Um, if anyone doesn't know how to do that, 
reach out to me on the Instagram. Uh, have a good one, guys. Happy New Year. Stay safe. More content coming in 2023. Oh, yeah, man. See you soon.